Hi, this is Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue reporting from Medscape. Joining me today is Anne Marie Navarre, who's an Associate Professor of Medicine at UT Southwestern, and ostensibly one of the, the world's experts on lipid lowering therapies and, and thinking about which therapies to use. So Anne Marie, thanks for joining me today. Oh, total pleasure, Michelle. So some of the buzz of this conference, and we're right now at, at ACC 2023, is the Clear Outcomes Trial and Bempidoic Acid. So this is the, the first clinical outcomes trial we've, we've had with Bempidoic Acid. Uh, do you want to maybe just talk about what makes Bempidoic Acid different than other lipid-lowering therapies? And then we'll think about the study results. Sure. You know, I think the first thing that's important to point out is what makes it the same. So Bempidoic Acid does something that we know works to lower cardiovascular disease, which is it upregulates LDL receptors. Um, it works in the same pathway as statins, but it works upstream from statins. Um, and so it, uh, it's a little bit different mechanistically. What makes it perhaps a little bit special compared with statins is that it's actually a prodrug and the enzyme that makes it active is, um, is not present in skeletal muscle. And so there's sort of this hypothesis that that may make it better tolerated in people with statins. Now, while Clear Outcomes wasn't a head-to-head -head study of bempidoic acid versus statins, it actually did um, look at bempidoic acid in patients with statin intolerance. So these are people who, uh, who hadn't been able to tolerate a statin or were only able to tolerate a low dose statin. And so people who were potentially set up to have you know, side effects from other lipid lowering therapy. Um, and, and really exciting to see the data that shows you know, really uh, similar rates of tolerability compared with placebo, but you know, more importantly, uh, confirm, confirmation that upregulating the LDL receptor does in fact prevent cardiovascular events via LDL lowering. So. Um, the trial met its primary endpoint um, and, and lowering cardiovascular events compared with placebo. Yeah, no, I think, I think it is exciting because until recently, our arsenal of non-statin therapies for lipid lowering was relatively small. You know, we had um, some therapies that, you know, we don't use them very commonplace anymore, but azetamide was an option and PCSK9 inhibitors are, are an option as well. Um, but I think that th there's certainly a lot of demand for um, for a different type of, of non-statin lipid lowering therapy. And here you've got one that works like a statin, um, and yet without, um, it appears, any of the muscle-related effects. Um, and also, it doesn't appear from clear outcomes that there was any increase in diabetes risk. Correct. Um, so no increase in diabetes risk. Really, the, the only two things that came out from clear outcomes in terms of risk would be a, a slight increase in the risk of gout, about a 1% increase in gout, and a 1% increase in um, cholelithiasis, um, but otherwise generally exceptionally well tolerated. You know, and in terms of, of options, you know, statins and azetamibe are great, but many patients do not get to LDL cholesterol targets um, with those two therapies alone. And so then you're looking at really, uh, until now, the only evidence-based therapy that we had were the PCSK9 inhibitor monoclonals. And the challenge for that is that not everybody wants to do a shot. Um, and those hadn't been specifically studied in the statin intolerant patients in, a, in a, an outcomes trial. Um, so we were you know, fortunate to have clear outcomes that is really focusing in on this kind of hard to treat population. Yeah, and, and to that point, so we now have data for bempidoic acid um, in patients who are quote unquote statin intolerant, and that in and of itself is of course a, a separate discussion. But we know a lot of people cannot tolerate statins or are unwilling to, to take a statin. Correct. Um, and so, you know, I think that this does help to potentially fill that, that unmet need. Where do you see bempidoic acid, though, fitting in um, for patients who are otherwise able to tolerate statin therapy, given that we don't yet have clinical outcome data? Do you think we need that before using it um, for those patients? Yeah, I think the biology here is very clear. You know, the lowering LDL cholesterol, particularly through the pathway of upregulating LDL receptors, works. Um, I, I don't see this needing any more data to be used as add-on to statin therapy. You know, at this point now, I think it really comes down to a, a conversation with patients about where their preferences are. Um, do you want to take a pill? Do you want to use a shot? Um, and and you know, unfortunately, oftentimes those decisions are often made by the payers and what what's the copay, what's their out-of-pocket cost, are we going to be able to sort of get the prior authorization through? I think in secondary prevention, it's going to be easy um, that, you know, that we've seen barriers really come down for add-on stat, non-statin therapy in ASCVD patients. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the primary prevention population. And 
I'm actually really excited to see the data from Clear Outcomes. One of the interesting things in the trial was that there was this perplexing trend towards there being greater benefit in those um, in the primary prevention space than secondary prevention. You know, and some of it might just be play of chance, of course. Um, but there were also those quirks in terms of there being more lipid-lowering therapy drop in for patients treated with placebo. Now, some of that is just, you know, the mechanics of, of the trial and some of the complexity that goes into it. But I suppose part of me was wondering whether or not there might have been more up titration of lipid lowering therapies that occurred in the secondary prevention patients, and that might have contributed to that attenuation of benefit in that group. I had the exact same questions. I think this is something we're going to see explored in a lot more detail. Um, it's most likely a, a statistical play of chance. I'm really struggling to imagine a biological explanation for why it works better in primary versus secondary prevention. That's usually not what we see in lipid lowering trials because it, it, it historically it's sort of more strong benefit in, in secondary prevention. Um, so I, I think we're gonna have to look more and see the trial data to see if there's an explanation beyond play of chance. From my perspective, I think it's really reassuring at least that at least there wasn't a signal you know, in the opposite direction that it didn't work at all in primary prevention. Mm -hmm. So sort of you know, more confirmation, lower is better in secondary prevention, but it's also lower is better in primary prevention. And, and I hope that trials like this will continue to sort of move that needle and have us thinking about preventing athro in the first place, um, rather than sort of thinking about these add-on therapies only in secondary prevention where you know, the horse is already out of the barn. Yeah, and the curves did diverge quite early, which I thought was interesting in terms of, um, you know, very often we, we think about the curves being largely superimposed for the first couple of years, suggesting a lag in benefit. But, but here it, it did appear early, which is nice. Now, just maybe my final question for you is that there are some who are saying, well, you know, the relative risk reduction was not that big, and we didn't see a reduction in cardiovascular mortality or all-cause mortality. Well, what do you say to that? Well, the first I would put into context, um, you know, this is a very well-treated population. These are patients who are on, you know, good background <clears throat> medical therapy. And if we look at the relative risk reduction for evolocumab or alirocumab, you're only looking at a 15% relative reduction mm -hmm. compared with 13% in clear outcomes. So it's actually pretty much what we would expect. Um, it's, it's square on the line for what we'd expect based on the amount of LDL reduction. Um, but the most important thing is that this trial was looking at the bempedoic acid monotherapy. And you know this is available in a combination tablet with ezetimibe as well. And we get a much bigger LDL reduction when we use it in combination with ezetimibe. And I think you know then extrapolating what's known from the benefit of ezetimibe, adding that in, you get a pretty solid LDL reduction with the two combined, about a 35% LDL reduction. So if we think about adding on to statin therapy, if if we're adding on a zetamide plus bempedoic acid, we're going to see a bigger, we would see a bigger relative risk reduction than what we saw in monotherapy alone. You know, in terms of mortality, I, I think this is a, sort of a time where we're a victim of our own success. It's, it's hard to die in the short term of, of coronary artery disease, of stroke. Our, our systems of care are better. Our acute treatments are better. Um, and, and so I think the gap in time between when you develop incident atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or, you know, an incident event and, and when you finally die is really pushed out and we just don't have the follow-up. But lipid lowering trials are consistent. Those Kaplan-Meier curves always get wider over time. We just saw the follow-up data from uh, Fourier and Fourier-Olé seeing, you know, long-term follow-up for patients with uh, treated with evolocumab ben benefit increases over time. I think that that's been consistent with all lipid lowering therapies. So really reemphasizing, get patients on treatment early, have them stay, emphasize adherence and keep them on therapy. And, and I think that what we're seeing in a trial is, is only sort of the very beginning of really sustained benefit over time. Well, I think it is exciting just to have another non-statin uh, lipid lowering therapy that appears to be effective in our arsenal. And, you know, of course, there'll continue to be conversations, I'm sure, about cost and, and where it fits into the algorithm. Um, but I think these results are, are still quite interesting to, um, to, to take a look at. I totally agree. Treating people with statin intolerance is hard, um, and it's frustrating for the patients as well. And it's it's nice to have a therapy that works, and it's nice to be able to tell our patients that this was a therapy that was studied in patients just like you. You know, almost 50% of the people in the trial were women, which is pretty reflective of what we see in sort of statin intolerance, which tends to affect women more than men. And 
So, you know, from a communication standpoint, being able to talk to our patients and say, this is a, this is a therapy that was felt specifically for people like you. You know, I'm, I'm really optimistic, hopeful maybe, that, um, that that's going to improve uptake at the patient level and maybe improve adherence over time too. But that's where the rubber meets the road. We as clinicians are going to have to really, you know, think about who's eligible for therapy, identify people who need up titration, and figure out how to get them to goal with any of the multiple tools in our armamentarium. Thank you again for joining me today. I really appreciate your time, and um, I look forward to talking about it more with you in the future. It's been my pleasure. Signing off from Medscape, this is Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue.